Now, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our 16th webinar. Uh, we started this webinar series back in June of last year, and we have a, a full extensive range that I'll go through in a, in a moment. But today's topic is we are going to start looking at biochar. It's an introduction of, run by Stephen McCormack, who was working for us on the Tree C project. And effectively, biochar, we'll go to run through the, the, the whole description of it later on in the program, but uh, it's a, something that new that Derby has taken on in the last couple of years. Uh, over the course of the series, it's, we've looked at all of the traditional uses that are of, of bioenergy. And in this series, we're going to, or this part, we're going to look at, at biochar as a material. Um, so, first off, the Irish Bioenergy Association, uh, most of you are very familiar with us. But we are the voice of Irish bioenergy in on the island of Ireland. We cover both uh, Ireland and Northern Ireland. And um, we have always covered fuels and materials such as biomass, biogas, and biofuels, um, the energy crop sector, all wood fuels. But uh, recently we've started also doing biochar uh, as a new material. So if you are interested in the association, you can go onto our website and look to find out more about us and perhaps getting involved with me member. And um, we do offer some very good opportunities for networking with other people interested in these sectors and um, getting to know exactly what's going on in the industry. So I'd recommend that to, to anybody that does have an interest in this area. Um, as I said, we have a, an extensive webinar series for anyone that is interested in looking back at the catalogue. The catalogue is available on our website, uh, www.erbia.org. We are continuing to roll out these webinars throughout 2021. The, we, we run them every fortnight on Wednesday morning at 9.30 till 10.30. And if you are interested in perhaps with some ideas for webinars or the certain things you'd like to see covered or any other general interest in that area, you can contact either Trees O'Brien or Sean Finan. Their details are there on screen and uh, they'll be able to, to assist you on that. Um, just a apologies actually for Sean Finan who can't be here this morning. Normally he's the, the chair of these events. So I'll take over that for this morning. So. Um, this today's agenda, as I said, is going to be on biochar. Uh, I'll be chairing it today. Uh, Steve McCormack is a project executive looking after biochar for Erbia. And during the course of his presentation, where he'll go through all of the, the details of it, if you do want to submit any questions, there's a question and answers tab at the bottom of the screen. So you can type in your answers there uh, during the, the course of his presentation. So as you, you think of any questions, you can submit them and we'll get to them then at the end. So uh, the next webinar we're going to hold is on the 24th of February. Again, Wednesday morning, 9.30 to 10.30. Uh, uh, we will confirm the topic and speakers uh, closer to the date. So uh, again, thanks very much for joining this morning. Today's webinar will be looking at biochar. So to give it a very basic one, but I'll leave, leave the, the bulk of this explanation to Stephen. Uh, we are looking at what, what exactly what it is. So we'll give an explanation of what biochar is, uh, how you make it, what it can be used for, and effectively, why would we would use it? You know, what would be effective in terms of be it climate control, environmental challenges that it can help to meet? You know, and it is a very diverse material, and it's something that I think you find very interesting. I have a list of some of the uses there, from using it in agricultural or forestry for soil amendments, for animal feeds, for slurry additives or fertilizer amendments. It can be used for wastewater treatment, which uh, Steve, Stephen might give some examples of later on in horticulture, which is particularly important now as a peat replacement, um, in the bioenergy sector or in construction. So again, I leave Stephen into the details in that. Uh, just to introduce Stephen, uh, Stephen is joined Erbia in late last year, 2020. He is working with us on the 3C project, but we're very familiar with Stephen. He previously worked with us uh, with Erbia when he was working with um, Western Development Commission on the redirect project, which is a precursor to the current 3C project, which he's working on. And 3C is basically looking at, at, at biochar. So Stephen is a graduate of Sligo IT with a degree in environmental science. He's currently undertaking a master's in environmental sustainability with UCD. And if anyone is interested in, in matters of this project or getting involved or further information, you can contact Stephen directly. Again, he'll give you all that information um, over the course of, of his presentation. So Stephen, I might just get you to come on, on screen there and we might look at getting your part started up. So let's stop that. Okay, Stephen, you're on mute there. Okay. Um, Perfect, yeah, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay. 
Okay. Okay, I'll leave it to you, Stephen. Please, Richard. That's great. Thanks, Noel. Okay, uh, thanks to Noel for the, the introduction there. Uh, as he said, my own name is Stephen McCormack, and I'm, I'm project officer with the Irish Bioenergy Association. So the purpose of this webinar was just to give a bit of background to uh, biochar, a bit of an explainer to the uninitiated. Uh, it might help provide a bit more context as to why it's increasingly been seen as a, a valuable bio-based material. So I will chat a little bit about what it is, how it's made, and detail just some of the things that can be used for, uh, including some of the positive environmental effects it can have and uh, why so many people see it as playing a role in addressing climate issues. I will then highlight some of the great Irish companies who are fully involved in this growing sector. And finally, I will provide just a brief update about our project uh, Tree C. Now, so I'll start at the beginning. So what is biochar? So in a nutshell, uh, it can be described as being a black solid material with a high carbon content, and it can be made from uh, a variety of biomass streams. So it is a product of what is known as pyrolysis. So that's a process I'll explain in a moment. And by its nature, it is extremely porous, uh, meaning that it has a large amount of pores on the surface, uh, similar to a sponge. So actually, in fact, to think of it as a sponge is helpful in understanding why it's uh, so useful. Now, it's also uh, often described as being recalcitrant. What that means in effect is that the material is extremely stable and doesn't degrade uh, quickly. It degrades extremely slowly over time. Now, to gain an understanding of why biochar is useful in so many different situations, it helps to think of it, as I said, as a, a stable black sponge on the micro scale. So if you were to image it using microscopes, you would see something like the, the picture here on the left. Uh, as you can see, it's full of pores, uh, nooks and crannies. So this in effect means it has an extremely large surface area. So uh, for example, one gram of certain biochars can have the same surface area as uh, a football field. So lots of surface area. And then another key aspect uh, is biochar cation exchange capacity. So it's a key property that is central to biochar environmental applications. Uh, and it's one that is based on charge interactions between positive and negative charges. So what it leads to is the retention of soil nutrients and soil amendments uh, and uh, removal of certain pollutants in water filtration applications. Uh, it can bind to heavy metals, for instance, and immobilize them. And it can in fact absorb a wide uh, variety of different substances. Now, due to the thermal conversion process, uh, biochar becomes extremely stable and does not degrade uh, over time in the same way that the, the parent material would have. So by decomposition and microbial action, for instance. So this in effect uh, means that the carbon is stored for, for long periods of time. So anywhere from decades to hundreds and possibly thousands of years and beyond. Now, uh, every unit of biochar on average is equivalent to about three units of CO2. Uh, come back to that in a while. So with that large porous surface area and its ability to hold on to moisture and uh, retain nutrients, another way biochar can be of interest to us it's a, is its ability to provide a habitat for mycorrhizal fungi and colonies of bacteria. So I've heard it likened before to a, a coral reef for soil life, and it can help increase uh, soil biodiversity, uh, which could have many benefits ranging from nutrient uh, cycling to disease resistance. So pictured here, you can see a, a variety of extreme close-ups of different biochars that have been colonized uh, by different microbes and fungi. They, they find homes in the, the pores uh, and the, the surface area. So biochar can also aid in resistance to drought uh, and can help improve so a soil's ability to retain water. Um, while that might not be as much of a, a factor here in Ireland at present uh, compared to other parts of the world, uh, perhaps we will see it become a consideration in future. Now biochar can also aid in the retention of nutrients as I've mentioned, and this is an area that is likely of more interest. So it can hold on to nutrients and prevent losses from leaching events, uh, perhaps in increasing uh, efficiencies of fertilizers being applied, or in particular, preventing them from being lost uh, to water courses during high rainfall events. Now, I can't continue a presentation about biochar without referencing the, the phenomenon known as terra preta or black soil. And it is one of the reasons behind the interest in biochar in recent years and its applications. So it was found that areas of highly productive soil in, uh, in parts of the Amazon basin uh, were as a result of man-made interventions 
where the addi addition of charcoal by indigenous people over time led to increases in soil productivity, uh, nutrient retention, and soil carbon content in these areas. Uh, and some of these soils are still producing today. So 2000 year old soil that is extremely productive. Now there's plenty of material online detailing this phenomenon, but I, uh, should you wish to find out more, but I just wanted to highlight it. Now, there are any number of biomass feedstocks that can be used when producing biochar, and the type of biochar will be determined by the composition of the feedstocks as well as processing conditions. So many facilities uh, are focused on the use of wood chips as a feedstock, but in reality, any biomass can be used. So biomass is mainly comprised of three constituent parts, uh, namely cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and the resultant uh, biochar will depend on the composition of these within the feedstock. And as a result, not all biochars are created equal. Uh, so for example, a biochar produced from grassy fibrous material may have less surface area or pores than one produced from fruit stones or hardwoods. And the carbon content and cation exchange capacity may also vary considerably. Now, before I go any further, I just thought it'd be no harm in distinguishing between what we term biochar uh, and similar products such as activated carbon and charcoal. So activated carbon is a, a further processed form of, of carbon, and typically it has been subjected to steam or carbon dioxide or perhaps a chemical activation process, which has the effect of increasing the surface area by expanding the pore sizes, uh, meaning it can act uh, as a better sponge. It could also be impregnated with other materials uh, to target specific pollutants, and it can be made from a suitably dense uh, biomass such as bamboo or coconut or nutshells, but also can more traditionally be made from uh, fossil sources such as lignite or brown coal. Uh, you'll also be aware you can find it in a wide range of products in your supermarket or pharmacy, everything from toothpaste to shower gel. Uh, but more typically it's used for the treatment of water, so if you think of your water filters here, uh, but it's also extensively used in industrial settings. Now uh, charcoal, as we described it, on the other hand is a bit easier to understand, so we usually refer to charcoal for the purposes of cooking or heating, uh, where calorific content is more important than surface area. Uh, so here we're talking about the likes of your barbecue charcoal. Now, so how is it made? So uh, pyrolysis is the, the, the basic concept behind it. Uh, and the basic process involves the thermal conversion of biomass in the absence of oxygen, or what is known as pyrolysis. Now, this image of a match explains a little bit about what happens uh, when the heat is applied, albeit done in the open air. But the basic principle behind the process is that when we apply heat to a biomass, it begins to give off uh, a combustible, uh, combustible products. So a bio-oil bio and uh, a gas, which is often referred to as syngas or pyrolysis gas, and typically is largely comprised of a mix of hydrogen, methane, uh, some carbon dioxide and some carbon monoxide. So this in a turn uh, ignites and then sustains the thermal reaction or becomes autothermic, uh, which will continue to uh, for some time. And the effect being that the area above the biomass is starved of oxygen, uh, leaving behind a char-like material, like the picture there in the match. Now in pyrolysis, typically this takes place in a, a closed vessel. But in reality, the basic reaction is biomass plus heat can give off uh, a liquid, a solid, and a gas. And depending on the product you want, there's a suite of different technologies and parameters that can be used to maximize the desired product. Now, so there are a wide variety of different technological processes summarized here in this slide, which biochar can be produced. I won't dwell on them for too long, but to give you an idea of some of the different parameters at play, such as residence time, uh, temperatures involved, carbon, carbon content, and biochar yields. Another important parameter includes uh, the feedstock moisture content and particle size. And as you will see here, the conditions that exist for under a slow pyrolysis are the ones most likely to heal, yield the highest carbon content char, which is typically what we're after. So what does all that mean in effect? So in reality, there are a growing number of different technologies available uh, for producing biochar. So ranging from uh, the low tech approach involving labor intensive batch processes and to continuous fed automated processes. So I just wanted to show you a few pictures of the wide range of production methods for biochar. So on the lower tech side of things are biochar kilns, such as the Contiki kiln pictured here. So once the thermal conversion process begins, once heat is applied, uh, the bias begins releasing the combustible gases. So in units like this, 
the, the, the gas that's given off will be angled by the shape of the kiln and it, it burns above the biomass, which essentially means the material at the bottom is now receiving low amounts of oxygen, which has the effect of charring the biomass. Now, this is a batch process. It's low cost, but labor intensive. So it can take hours and requires careful monitoring. And it will also require dry biomass uh, as a feedstock. Otherwise, you'll end up with a lot of smoke and particulates. Uh, but slow pyrolysis this way, if done right, can produce a high carbon content quality char. But if it's done wrong, however, you could end up with a pile of ash or a half charred material containing uh, nasties such as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons or PAHs, uh, which are known carcinogens. Now, there are any number of designs for these types of kilns online, if you look. And then picture here, we have what is known as an Exeter retort. So essentially a trailer mounted twin chambered unit the material you want to char goes in in the inner chamber and then you load up smaller kindling material on the outer chamber, you light it. And then once it's lit, you seal it up. Uh, after about an hour or so, the biomass will give off the combustible syngas, uh, which gets diverted back into the outer chamber and the process becomes autothermic, uh, meaning it continues to heat itself. Now again, this uh, would require careful monitoring and it will need to cool down completely before the retort is opened or else it will auto ignite or burst into flames. Uh, another thing I might mention briefly here is that some char production units have funnels uh, up above the stacks that allow the early smoke to be gathered and condensed into what is known as wood vinegar, uh, which has a range of potential applications ranging from uh, biostimulants for plants to biopesticides. But now for consistency and replicability uh, and for a product that could be certified, fully controlled continuous fed units such as the ones pictured here are what's required. Uh, the units typically come fitted with uh, flameless oxidizers or afterburners, which oxidize any uh, potential harmful particulates at extremely high temperatures. So these units will have a means to utilize the excess heat produced. Uh, so whether that is to uh, pre-dry new material or new feedstocks, or as the case in Carbofex in Finland, to provide carbon negative district heating. Now, they tend to come in different sizes and price points, with a range of different throughputs per hour, uh, but they're increasingly being installed all around the world, and there are any number of companies developing their own versions of these kilns. Now, before I leave the technology side of things, it's also worth noting that while I'm uh, focusing on biochar production, these machines can in essence be considered as biomass boilers or waste to energy machines and can easily be tweaked to not only handle biochar production from biomass, but also for the production of bio oil and syngas, uh, so two energy, energy carriers that are storable and may be used to replace uh, fossil fuel counterparts. Now, there are uh, challenges associated with these. They may need upgrading and, for example, can be a corrosive. But however, we might see them uh, increasingly being used in different settings uh, for the provision of bioenergy. Now, so onto some of the potential uses for biochar. So there's many potential areas within the agri and forestry sector where biochar can be applied, and I might just touch on a few. So for instance, many are reporting success with the addition of biochar scattered across slurry storage in, to aid in the reduction of fugitive emissions and odors. The same with poultry units, uh, any area where ammonia and odors give rise to issues. Uh, in doing so, the carbon content of the manure will be increased and when it comes time to land spreading, the biochar will be charged with nutrients and microbial life. And then when it goes out onto the soil, it is hoped that this will aid in preventing leaching and runoff following rainfall events, and it can also help build soil carbon. There are also commercially available products consisting of high quality biochar um, that is safe for consumption by animals. So horses, ruminants, uh, cattle and goats, pigs and poultry. And the reason for doing so can include stu uh, uh, studies have shown positive responses to biochar supplementation, including uh, improved growth performance, blood profiles, egg yield, an ability to resist pathogens such as pathogenic gut bacteria, and indeed a reduction in methane production by ruminants. Um, that there also uh, improve overall animal health, increase, increase nutrient intake efficiency, and thus productivity. Now, as the biochar gets enriched with nitrogen-rich organic compounds during digestion, the excreted uh, biochar manure becomes a more valuable organic fertilizer, uh, causing lower nutrient losses and greenhouse gas emissions during storage and soil application. This is often termed uh, the carbon cascade effect, so getting multiple uses from the same biochar. 
Uh, now, another er interesting area is the EU organic fertilizer regulations recently passed and is due to come into effect next year, meaning organic fertilizers can contain biochar as a constituent. So this will hopefully see an increase in both demand and production across the board. Now, biochar is often incorporated into animal bedding to reduce odors, uh, to lock up nutrients from excreta, to reduce potential pathogens, and in turn will also uh, then provide an improved form of composted manure. Evidence has shown that uh, certain types of biochar uh, prove beneficial in boosting biogas yields when added in the right dosage to anaerobic digestion tanks. So all of the above uh, so-called carbon cascades when added to soil uh, make the material useful for soil amendments or additives. They allow for nutrient retention, uh, preventing losses and in increasing efficiencies. Um, it can also provide a buffer against the stress of drought conditions should they arise. And then when it's added to the land in liquid form, it can make its way down into the soil uh, better than the powder or solid form. Now, biochar is also finding applications at the, the planting stages of forestry, uh, so allowing for applications of fertilizers and nutrients to be retained around the root systems and providing a good start in life to new trees. So this can be especially beneficial in nutrient poor soils. Uh, there's work underway looking at other ways uh, biomaterials can be incorporated at the planting stage with, in combination with uh, biochar to reduce susceptibility to pests and diseases. Now in areas that are prone to wild and forest fires, including the US management strategies are in place where the biomass uh, that increase the risk of damage are being carbonized and reapplied. Now material from previous forest fires also serve as feedstock for other biochar based products. Now, while Ireland isn't as vulnerable at present to forest fires, we do suffer annually from wildfires in areas that are important uh, habitats for vulnerable species, including uh, ground nesting birds. So every year we see destruction uh, brought by gorse fires. Uh, and that gorse wood, as it happens when chipped and pyrolyzed, makes an extremely high quality biochar. Now, for use within the horticultural sector, there's a growing number of commercially available horticultural products uh, available from all, all corners of the globe. So pictured here are products from uh, the UK, from the US and Australia. Now while biochar is often sold in its raw state, which is useful in situations, uh, for horticultural applications, it's better pre-mixed with beneficial organics. Uh, and these can range from seaweed blends, uh, worm casts, uh, fungi, manures uh, and even frass, an in insect manure, which has the added benefit of preventing damage by pests. Uh, biochar and compost blends are being sold as peat moss replacements. And with uh, TV shows such as Gardener's World asking viewers uh, to purchase only peat-free compost mixes and with the end to the availability of the material, uh, attention will perhaps shift in the direction to these alternatives. The liquid blends pictured here are also an interesting one because they can spray it uh, with spraying equipment and make their way down into the soil and they don't pose the same hazard you might have uh, on a windy day, for example, when uh, uh, applying powdered biochar. Now, another area that has seen biochar pay dividends is uh, the city of Stockholm, where the municipality uh, embarked on trials to develop methods of improving the viability and quality of trees within the urban landscape. So they developed what they termed structural soils. Uh, that this involved mixing uh, a mix of stone chippings, uh, biochar and compost uh, situated in pre-fabricated uh, concrete forms that are placed within uh, pavings and, and, and parks. With the end result being that they had healthier, greener trees in the city uh, and the systems help filter water runoff from pavements and roads uh, in an integrated approach. Um, there are now companies and municipalities replicating this approach all over. Now onto uh, water quality treatment. So some biochars may prove suitable for the treatment of water quality, uh, particularly material that was suitably dense prior to carbonization, such as nutshells and fruit stones and bamboo, uh, particularly if they can be further processed into activated carbon. So they can be added to wastewater treatment plants where they do their job binding to uh, pollutants such as pharma residues uh, and nutrients. They improve the, the quality of the water that gets discharged to the environment. Now, it's not that commonly practiced in Ireland, but perhaps we might see that change in the future as we aim to improve the quality status of our water bodies. Uh, in, a, in a domestic setting, however, biochar has been incorporated into soak pits and percolation areas for domestic septic tanks as a filtration medium. 
It's been uh, incorporated into suds, swells, and constructed wetlands. Uh, it's also showing promise in reducing eutrophication incidents through the use of biochar socks and pontoons, which can be placed in streams, uh, ponds, and lakes. So biochar can be placed in flotation balls and cages or sacks, which are then tethered along shorelines and in critical locations to the water bodies, uh, like where an inlet enters a lake, uh, and they can be left there as a passive filtration device for a period of months and then removed and then replaced. Uh, and anybody who is aware of the eutrophication issues in Ireland might see potential in this application. Um, another example of where biochar is used to improve water quality, uh, this is uh, Stormwater Biochar, it's a US company. So they produce a wide range of biochar based products for the management of stormwater, uh, dealing with pollutants such as heavy metals, uh, fuel oil spills and excess nutrients. And again, it's not too hard to envisage how these booms and stocks could be deployed in an Irish context. Now, so I've highlighted uh, the fact that biochar production has the ability to sequester carbon, but what do we mean when we say that exactly? Well, a report by the IPCC in 2018 identified six potential technologies that were capable of CD or, or carbon dioxide removal. So the process of removing CO2 from the atmosphere so they describe this as being the opposite of emissions, so hence the phrase uh, negative emissions. Broadly speaking, they can be broken down into two types, so either enhancing existing natural processes that remove carbon from the atmosphere, or using chemical process, uh, for example, to capture CO2 directly from ambient air and store it elsewhere. So while there are technologies such as bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or direct air carbon capture and storage, I continue to see development and research, uh, afforestation, reforestation alongside land management techniques to increase carbon in soils are areas where the price point is low enough uh, for it to be considered doable at scale. And this is where biochar steps in. So once it's produced, it has the ability to lock in carbon for decades or even centuries. So it can add, be added to soil and make it more productive. It can uh, help increase the soil carbon content and soil organic matter content. If you integrate biochar production with uh, waste management, uh, or perhaps instead of the, using the word waste, uh, consider uh, the phrase underutilized resources. So if, if you can produce biochar for some of the vast amounts of biomass material that uh, every year would either rot, uh, uh, release its carbon into atmosphere, or indeed be burnt, uh, releasing its carbon into atmosphere, so if you can produce biochar from these materials uh, and in doing so produce some thermal energy, a valuable bio-based material, which is a very stable form of carbon, which can then go on to perform a number of useful environmental services, all the while sequestering carbon, then the conversation should shift away from one of waste management to uh, resource management, the bioeconomy and indeed the, the circular economy. Now, with all that in mind, perhaps the best way to explain some of the potential products and services that can exist if we is if we're to have a look at some of the Irish companies making waves in the, the biochar world. So, firstly, we have a uh, Greenbelt Biochar. So they produce a high-quality, uh, carbon-rich biochar, which is sustainably produced from local Irish timber growers, and has been used predominantly uh, in soil amendment settings across dairy and beef uh, farm enterprises. Uh, the company is also applying their biochar to forestry products and adding commercial value as well as carbon capture and storage. Next up, we have Robert and Peter and the team at Arigna. We've been working here hard over the past 10 years to develop a, a pyrolysis plant, and they've tried many different materials over the years to identify one uh, which they could use to develop a renewable fuel uh, for the domestic heating market. And they've settled on olive stones, so residuals from the olive oil processing industry. So picture there is their, their harvest flame, uh, which is made from pyrolyzed olive stone, which is then briquetted. So the same process as it happens can be used to make another high quality biochar, and they've seen orders for this material increase recently. So th they're able to provide bulk quantities and the biochar has been trialed uh, for poultry litter and composting process, for boosting gas yields and anaerobic digesters, and as a substrate for, for green roofs. Uh, and it's also the biochar that's been used for our next Irish company. So uh, pro-biocarbon, so Dr. Karen O'Hanlon has developed a range of products under the pro-biocarbon name. So plant and soil health, it's an organic liquid fertilizer con containing a range of plant uh, growth promoting bacteria, uh, Azobacter, Pseudomonas and Bacillus subtilis. So they all have different beneficial properties. 
Then we also have ProBio uh, Carbon Enriched Carbon Feed, which is an organic solid fertilizer made from uh, biochar from Robert and the team at Arigna, which is then enriched with this plant growth promoting bacteria. Now, all of these uh, products have recently been certified organic by the Irish Organic Association. Uh, then next up, we have David and Nick from RNS Biomass, who are producing high quality feed grade biochar for from differently uh, different local sourced hardwood species, uh, and they're trading under the name Origin Biochar. <coughs> Excuse me. So they're, <coughs> they're producing Equichar, which is a product here pictured for the equine industry, so a feed additive for horses. They're producing Agrichar, which is targeted uh, at the agricultural industry for, as a feed additive. And they're also producing uh, raw char, which is a, a horticultural land-based industry product to be sold onto processors, retailers, and domestically to, to gardens and landowners. The guys are also agents for uh, biomecon pyrolysis units in Ireland and the UK, and I'm sure they'd be happy to uh, address any queries regarding the units uh, that they have installed. And that picture there is one they have installed in the north. Next up, we have Eddie and the team at Heat Systems who have been involved in the thermal processing solutions for years, uh, and they hope to develop Ireland's first uh, carbon regeneration facility uh, at their site in Clare Morris. So they design a number of technology solutions are involved in ongoing research activities uh, around carbon. Uh, and of course, then next, I'm sure many of you might be familiar with the Irish Biochar Cooperative, who have been actively promoting some of the many potential benefits from making and using biochar here in Ireland over the years. They're also involved in the EIP uh, funded biomass to biochar project, which among other activities is developing a, a mobile pyrolysis unit. Uh, and then finally, if you're looking to uh, get into production or if you have a feedstock that you think might be good for biochar and you wanted to test it for suitability, Daniel and the team at Salignus have developed, developed a suite of biochar testing packages for those uh, looking to commercialize products. So they can help analyze your biochar samples for various properties based on the, the intended applications. Uh, anything ranging from pore size and distribution, particle sizes, moisture content, Elemental analysis, uh, water holding capacity, capacity uh, yeah, look at you name it. The, if, if it's relevant to biochar quality, they can test it. And I, I'd urge you to get in touch if you, if you want to uh, talk to them about it. Now, um, I would just draw your attention to some of the other following developing sectors. Um, uh, so we, as I mentioned before, the, the biofertilizer market will no doubt see uh, be a growth sector alongside the European drive towards a circular economy. There's also the area of using biochar as a base for construction aggregate uh, for buildings and indeed asphalt or tarmac uh, and concrete as in some cases. So in the process, uh, improving the materials, sequestering carbon in the process, and there's, there's companies doing this already. We have companies, uh, startup companies such as Made of Air in Germany, who are working on a biochar based construction materials and thermoplastics. We have companies such as Carbofex in Finland and Eco Era in Sweden that are providing district heating combined with biochar production. But they're also trading uh, CO2 removal certificates on the Puro Earth uh, platform. Um, so, allowing companies uh, like Microsoft, you may have seen the news recently, Shopify and Stripe to purchase uh, verifiable carbon sinks. Now, char, now I won't call it biochar, but char can also be used as a, as a fuel source uh, for both domestic and industrial heating. Projects in Canada that are looking to reduce carbon footprint in steel production, and cement production, by using char as a fuel source. There's also projects uh, that are gasifying sludges uh, for provision of energy. Uh, so sewage sludge and municipal sludge, uh, and they're also uh, reducing the environmental impacts associated with their treatments, uh, traditional treatments. Now, I just want to uh, touch briefly upon the, the TREC projects that we're involved in here at Erbia. Uh, so TREC, it stands for creating the, the circular carbon economy. Um, so it's an interreg Northwest Europe funded project, which will run to the end of uh, December, 2022. So it sees 13 project uh, partners and sub partners spread out over six participating countries, uh, including Germany, Belgium, France, the Netherlands, Wales, and of course, Ireland. Uh, it has a specific thematic priority focus on the area of innovation. And the idea is that we, we aim to assist and support innovative SMEs and startups looking to develop uh, biochar-based products and services. 
Now, it will do so through the rollout of um, three different work packages. So first up, we have CC hubs or circular carbon hubs. So there are plans for seven hubs spread out across the six different countries. And the idea is to provide access to expertise and knowledge as well as technical support and advice, uh, and that'll extend across the, the, the different countries. Uh, some of the activities that are planned for the hubs, it is hoped to be able to uh, inform on an approach to biomass and carbon management through workshops, uh, putting producers in touch with potential clients or product developers, as well as working out with stakeholders related to the harvesting, collection, conversion of biomass. Uh, next up, we have uh, the CC Lab, where product and feedstock quality will be the mainstay. Uh, we'll have a central lab uh, based in Germany with plans for a number of satellite labs uh, where the focus will be on ensuring uh, quality with plans to develop a, a quality assurance label, looking at optimizing blends for different applications. Um, and then finally, we will have uh, what's called CC Net or CC Network. Uh, and that is an overarching umbrella network uh, which aims to connect all the individual stakeholders across the different regions, uh, provide access to training, marketing advice and mentorship, uh, access to investor platforms. They're just some of the, uh, the many activities uh, planned. So that's uh, the, a quick synopsis of the Tree C project. Uh, the activities will be increasing over the coming months um, and we'll have a project website launched. So, that's my presentation done. I might have gone on for a bit longer than I intended. Uh, now, I only touched on some of the potential applications. We would hope to explore uh, the, some of the areas a bit more in detail in future webinars. Uh, and this was just done as a means of an introduction. So here are my contact details. Um, please do get in touch if you have any questions or if you want to follow our account on Twitter. It's there at Ireland underscore redirect. And uh, I'll hand you back over to Noel. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was uh, very informative, um, and it gave a very good impression of the range and depth of uses uh, that biochar can can take on. Um, again, I just remind the listeners there we have an, a question and answers tab at the bottom of the screen. If anyone wants to put in their the queries there, we'll take that on board and we'll be able to pass on the questions to Stephen and, and answer them here live. So if you do want to start typing away there on, on the questions, see them flying in as already. So. Uh, Stephen, I think we may uh, get started on those. Um, I suppose the first one up here is from Brian. Stephen, you're referring to it as biochar, but he's asking, is biochar, uh, is it only just termed biochar if it's loaded or inoculated with microbiology? Um, so, it, it, yeah, no, there's raw biochar and then biochar inoculated with uh, microbiology. So raw biochar would be uh, fresh out of the kiln. It would still be deemed as biochar. Some people would define biochar uh, as uh, a charcoal material for, for intended use in environmental applications or agricultural applications. Uh, and there is a bit of a debate over whether biochar being used uh, to go into, say, construction materials is actually biochar. For me, biochar would be any material that comes from a, a, a biomass source that is converted uh, into a charcoal material for the purpose. For the, not for the purposes of uh, being burnt, so for the purposes of being used as a as a, uh, a char-like material, but not for the purposes of uh, combustion. Yeah, just to take a sensible uh, approach in the, in the name and culture of it. And that's we often see that new technologies, the naming uh, of certain aspects are always uh, batted around for a number of years before it settles down into something um, consistent. Now, a question here from David. There are lots of uses. Um, is there enough supply and sources, uh, presumably raw material, and what would be the best feedstock for biochar in Ireland? Okay, so uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, not all biochars are created equal. Um, so, like, there's any amount of feedstocks, um, and it depends on the application that, uh, like, what, what feedstock you would choose to to pyrolyze essentially, so uh, like they all have different physical properties in terms of uh, pore size and distribution, uh, cation exchange capacity. So it depends if it's if, if it's going into soil uh, or if it's going into animal feeds. Uh, hardwood species are particularly good. Um, uh, the olive stone biochar is pretty, particularly good. If you're using say biochar from the grassy fibrous materials, you might necessarily have as much pore size. So look, literally, it just depends on, on the application and where you intended to go. Um, 
And as in terms of like a shortage of materials, there's any amount of material that gets cut and rot at roadsides uh, uh, in fields every year that decompose and just release the carbon to atmosphere. It's not too hard to envisage uh, incentivizing people to uh, bring this to a central processing facility and convert it to biochar. And I think it's an area that we'll see development in, in, in coming years is making the most of this material that otherwise just uh, is not used. So literally it could be anything. Um, we have uh, the, the previous project redirect uh, has an interesting uh, uh, site in, in Germany that literally takes uh, green waste from the municipality. Uh, they grade it, they chip it, but they also take leaf litter, they take food residue. They have a whole process where uh, it goes through anaerobic digestion, it goes through a thermal conditioning stage, uh, it gets pelletized. So grassy fibrous material can be pelletized and then pyrolyzed. So literally you can use any any biomass material. It doesn't have to be uh, from a forest. Uh, would, it, would it be fair to say then that different materials that produce a different, I won't say a different quality or a higher or lower quality, but biochar with different parameters that, you know, so we might find that a, say a biochar from one material might suit a particular use and then biochar from another, another might uh, go for a, a second use. Absolutely. And it, it might be that, uh, say, for example, if you're trying to reduce pollutants from from, uh, from water runoff or wastewater, it might be that a blend of different materials. So you might do different batches of different materials and then blend them to, to cover their range of different pore sizes and, and uh, its capacity to ab absorb different pollutants. Uh, and, and in those situations, a mix would probably be what you're looking for. And this is some of the some of the questions we, we hope yeah. to address within the Treacy project. So there, there's quite a lot of um, understanding to be got in the different ranges of biochar and obviously in the uses, but as you're saying there, the different parameters, you know, we have to make, might have go with certain blends. So the science behind all this and understanding of the different um, criteria in each biochar is going to be crucial to its use or beneficial yes. to its use so we get the optimum use out of it. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, now, so a somewhat related uh, question there from Tom is asking, what about the regulation about use of biochar? And I suppose it's similar to a question I was uh, considering as you were speaking. Um, is there a, a certification already in place for, for biochar? Or how, you know, if somebody just comes in with grey dark material, black dark material, how would you say that's biochar or not? What is the, is there, you might just explain that out a little bit. Yeah, so if you want to sell it as a, a, a commercial product um, within Europe. Uh, the certification standard at the moment is the EBC or European Biochar Certificate. Um, okay. So that involves uh, getting uh, a sample of your biochar that's produced, uh, analyzed um, by a, an accredited lab uh, for a range of different components to make sure you're not introducing PAHs um, heavy metal content or different pollutants. Because uh, if you are to go down that route and you apply it to the food chain or uh, if it gets into the soil, yeah. it can be very hard to get it back out. Yeah. yeah, I would assume that there are certain regulations you also, uh, as well as certification in biochar, if we're going to use it, for example, in, in feeding animals or even, you know, we can look at, at we see carbon products in human uh, consumed products as well, or if you're going to use it in the environment, there's presumably regulation we'll have to, to, to match there as well. Absolutely, uh, just from a, a safety point of view. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, one question in there from Mary uh, Does biochar have a place in bog restoration? Quite an interesting question, actually, as we're looking at, we have huge areas of, of bogland now to look at restoring with the just transition. So it, would biochar be able to fit into that space? Um, that's it. That is an interesting question. And uh, I, I don't have an answer for you. Uh, at, 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 at present, um, it, it'd be one worth uh, having a further conversation on and look at, uh, I will try and find out the answer uh, and maybe get back to, in touch with you, Mary. I, I don't have a straight answer for you at the moment. It, it could be an interesting uh, yeah, the, the, interesting research topic, definitely. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Thanks for that question, Mary. Um, it, does, it does definitely look at a, an interesting use for it. Um, for it, it could have a very beneficial fa fact. Um, if using a question there from Will, if using small size material like sawdust to generate biochar, is the final product uh, of lower quality than using larger material like wood chip? So is the grain size important going in? Um, so it, it depends on the the technology that's been used to process it. Uh, so some technology is capable of processing uh, smaller particle sizes, um, like. Often when 
large chunks come out of the end of the pyrolysis unit, uh, it might yet be crushed to powder it because it's easier to, uh, to, to apply a powdered uh, material to, for various different applications. Uh, so in many cases, you don't want large chunks of biochar. You want a powder at the end. So now you might have a problem with losing more of it to, to ash in the process if it is too small going in. And uh, look at sawdust, it, it can absolutely be uh, it can absolutely be used to make biochar, definitely, without, without question. Uh, it just depends on the range of processing technologies involved. Um, yeah, so it, it, it's not a, it wasn't the fact that it it's going it, to be a different no, quality. No, it wouldn't just, prohibit you. Yeah. Yeah, it's just that the, the processing, you might have to just take certain care in processing, but it, it could be beneficial as well. So it's a, a parameter that you just take uh, account of. A uh, question there from Tim. Uh, Stephen, excellent presentation. A number of uh, comments there, an excellent presentation there, Stephen, by the way. Um, are there already any clean mobile pyrolysis technologies um, in Ireland, or is anyone developing on that? Um, the answers in, in notes, uh, especially NOx emissions filters. Um, so I'm not quite sure. So are there any clean mobile pyrolysis technologies, especially NOx, especially NOx emission filters in Ireland, or is anyone developing on that? Um, not mobile, not just yet. Um, uh, the not, not a commercially available product that's mobile, um, no. Uh, most of them are static sites uh, and they will have, like I said, a, a, an oxidizer, a flameless oxidizer or an afterburner, it might be described, that will put the emissions through at, a, at extremely high temperatures to, to, to kill off some of the, the particulates and nasties that, that, that come out of the emissions. Uh, but in terms of a mobile unit, uh, not that I'm aware of now. Uh, it, it may be that they're in development in other places, but uh, not, not commercially available in Ireland just yet. Yeah, I suppose one thing to take note is it's a, it's a uh, in one sense, a partial combustion. Would you describe it as that when, when you're going to biochar? And yep. when we're getting into that space, we have to be very careful of emissions coming off that the material, uh, the, whatever has been volatilized. Um, a question there from David. Uh, I ask from a planning pr uh, perspective for land. Also, I assume the resulting target market uh, use is important and that planning for margin uh, would mean planting for specific use that adds value. I'm just trying to determine exactly what uh, the question in that. Um, that may be related to, to a previous question. So one moment. Um, um, so also I assume the resulting target market use market is important that a planning for margin would mean planting for specific use that adds value. So we might come back to that one, uh, Steve, I'm not quite sure uh, what he's asking on that one. Okay. Um, a question there from Donald. Uh, surface water treatment seems a good possibility to improve water quality in, in water courses. Uh, planning authorities need to be brought on board though. Yeah, so would there be, within the project, would you be looking at engaging with, with local authorities? Uh, you showed some slides that have been used uh, we've often seen pictures in the news of for this pollution event and we see these booms thrown across rivers so um obviously this similar materials are the we use absorbent materials already so do we need to engage those authorities to i i would absolutely love to engage with authorities and, and get a few uh, demonstration uh, sites up and running uh, and work with our biochar producers to maybe develop blends of biochars and see which are particularly effective at reducing especially phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, we know we have huge issues with our, uh, our, our water bodies in Ireland. Um, and, you know, like you nearly hear a story every week about our degrading water qualities. And it is an area that we would love to explore further. Uh, and if we can do that uh, in cooperation with local governments, that'd be great. So, yeah, presumably uh, like the EPA would obviously, they produce their reports every year on water quality in Ireland. And it's an area that they take a national perspective of. So presumably they would be someone you might look to engage with as well during the course of, of the next couple of years and the industry would look to engage with? Absolutely. And local lo local groups like uh, water catchment uh, groups, uh, I, I know there's issues and we've engaged with some of them in the past and look at it. It's an area we'd love to explore further. Okay. Um, a comment there from Colin Keyes. Uh, there is a very useful resource that catalogues the characteristics of biomass resources called Phyllis 2 which is managed by a NWE Interreg uh, 5B project called Brisk2. Uh, I think it's searchable by anyone. So if anyone is looking for that, it's a catalogue of biomass resources called Phyllis2, P-H-Y-L-L-I-S-2. So, um, and it's under a project called Brisk2. So that would be a, an interesting 
um, resource. Now I see uh, Colin has sent a link to that to us as well. So uh, it's phyllis.nl. So we might look at putting that onto the material going out um, at the end of the, 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 this um, webinar. So people will have that link. Um, I had a question there from Brian. Thanks, Stephen. Is the material used, uh, if, if the material used is a waste, such as green waste, as you mentioned, does biochar fall, production fall under waste incineration in the EPA's eyes? Uh, so I guess the, the word incineration gets uh, bandied about. Uh, I try and distance myself from the word incineration. So pyrolysis is absolutely not incineration. It's thermal conversion process. If it was up to me, I would consider it as a, a recycling technology for a thermal conversion process. Uh, in the EPA's eyes, um, no, because they're not being they're not being licensed as incinerators. Uh, I, I think it depends on the size and production and throughput per year, and can depend on local planning and, and things like that. Um, but for instance, the, the biomacon boiler picture earlier on is technically classed as a, a biomass boiler. Um, uh, so you look at it, it; just depends on the technology. Um, but no, I wouldn't put class it as an incineration technique, or uh, and I don't think it. it it's classed as that under the EPA eyes. So there's probably a need, well, just to make sure that uh, EPA is often good, they obviously have a cautious approach to any new technology. So there's yep. probably a good need to engage with them so that they understand exactly what's, what's happening within the technology space and, and how they can uh, adapt it into their, their remit. Yeah. Um, now, a question here for Anonymous. Uh, many thanks for this. Most of these applications to date seem to be focused on production of biochar uh, so on the production of biochar with less focus on syngas or heat. Uh, you also mentioned uh, some other products there, Stephen, as well, which is interesting. Um, is there further information available on any products or uh, projects in Ireland or elsewhere that are aiming at heat, uh, syngas, uh, uh, biochar as a product? So you did mention the district heating already, and I suppose you can elaborate a bit on that, but is there other materials we could look at? Um, so uh, there's, there's no... Um running projects that I'm aware of that are focused on syngas. Uh, the, the, the heat element, uh, absolutely, there's a large amount of heat produced uh, during biochar production. And for efficient, efficiencies to be maximized, that heat should absolutely be used uh, and not just discharged to environment. So like I said, whether it's uh, to pre-dry a new feedstock coming in, or if it's to provide process heat, um, or whether it's to provide, say, for instance, carbon negative district heating, uh, which, you know, is in itself a, a very desirable thing to achieve. Um, there, like I said, I'm not aware of any projects in Ireland that are looking at that at the moment. Um, we are involved in hopefully going for a, another project application that might look at the syngas side of things, but uh, for the moment, uh, none, none existing that I know of. Um, so, Okay. Um, but somewhat related to that as well is the next question, and it's it's giving into sort of some thoughts that come into my own mind as I listened to you earlier on. Uh, is again from an anonymous uh, participant. Could there be any? Could there be really an economic opportunity for burying biochar in soils in Ireland simply for carbon sequestration? Uh, any functional uses uh, you have mentioned must surely have far more potential to develop the biochar sector. So uh, if a, if the questioner doesn't mind me adding to that a little bit. Um, in terms of carbon sequestering, you might explain we, we're going to take biochar. I mean, presumably we're not leaving it in bags and sheds. How do we, if we're going to look at the long-term storage of carbon, how is that physically utilised, and is there additional side benefits to that? Um, and again, the, the main question on that from the participant was, uh, is there an economic opportunity there? Um, so, at the moment. Uh, if you're looking at cost of a, a ton of biochar, so if you just take the, the basic carbon accounting, so on average, uh, about three tons of dry feedstock, maybe between 20, 25, 30% moisture content, will produce in, in proper pyrolysis kilns, will produce about one ton of biochar uh, thereabouts. That's kind of a, a, a loose rule of thumb. Uh, now that one ton of biochar uh, is equivalent to about, and again, between two and three tons of carbon dioxide uh, equivalent. So for, I, I mentioned uh, Puro Earth, uh, and they are a, a car voluntary carbon market, essentially, where they're paying producers for every ton of biochar that they are selling. They're selling 
their biochar onto be used in agricultural settings or for water treatment or for, for whatever. But they're also selling the equivalent amount of CO2 that is locked up in that carbon uh, onto companies like Microsoft and uh, Spotify or Shopify and Stripe. So roughly there you're talking about uh, 60 euro per ton is given to the biochar producer per ton of CO2. So that has the impact of giving additional revenue streams for companies who are willing to go through the life cycle assessment and certification process to become a registered uh, seller on the Pure Earth platform, uh, an additional maybe 200 euros per ton of biochar uh, that they produce. Um, so that is an additional mm. incentive. But again, this has to be done in, in processed and controlled conditions. It can't be done in, in the small scale. Um, in terms of uh, cost for simply just for carbon sequestration, the co cost of production, uh, you're, like if you were to buy a, a ton of biochar, it can be anywhere between six and 800, up to a thousand euro per ton. So uh, it, it helps the economics. It doesn't. It does uh, help the economics. The but economics. I, if you had a large parcel of land yeah. and you were wanting to know, could it be paid for sequestering carbon? I, I don't think so. No, not, not, not yet. We have ways to go yet. But, but the it's, idea it's is that... very, it, I presume it's seen as a very welcome and interesting development to see the, the, that being recognised and, and financially supported like that by the likes of Microsoft and others. Absolutely. And look, at, uh, it's, a, it's an area it's, I find it fascinating and yeah. uh, we hope to explore again future future webinars, definitely. Okay. Um, I'll just go to the last question as a few in the chat section as well. Um, again, this is just clarifying. Thanks, David, for coming back to that question. I was a bit confused on earlier on. Um, it was asked in relation to the first question. Basically, if you had a field, what would you plant uh, to sell a large market uh, use product with high margin, especially with regard to export? Um, so you're talking about essentially growing crops for the purpose of producing biochar, is, I presume. I, I, I'm taking that assumption, yes. Um, so and and again, go? I don't know, all biochars are not, created equal, I guess, I, like if, if it was me, I'd probably do a, a mix of uh, hardwood species um, I, I, and maybe fast growing material. Again, it, it depends on the on the, the application use and, and like what sort of biochar you're looking to produce. Uh, I, I look at, it could be something we can explore for later and see what grows in Ireland. Ireland is lucky and it's in the position that we can grow biomass pretty quick. Um, so there is opportunities there, but I couldn't give you a definitive answer. It depends on what sort of product you want to produce. Perfect, perfect. Okay, well, look, that's and again, yeah, it is a case of we do have to look at what materials um, we can plant, and there's obviously you know when we're looking at the whole forestry sector and and if we're looking at uh, woodland in a context of this, biochar is one of those products that can come out of that, and you look you look at all, the whole range of products. Um, both commercial and uh, ecological wise as well, I can come out of those spaces. And it, it's probably a, a question of, you might not just plant just to produce biochar, it might be for a whole range of, of, of uses um, and a whole, there, there's a whole range of things that feed into the economics to make it viable. Um, just, I noticed a few there things coming in the comments and just flicking down through those. Um, so there are a number of people thanking you on that there, Stephen. Um, no, I, and again, Teresa, who works tirelessly in the background here in producing these webinars and has done since the start. So I see she's just forwarded on anyone that's interested in that link. Teresa has put it up on the on the chat box. Uh, so phyllis.nl. And that will give you that, that searchable database for biochar characteristics. Um, so that's uh, available to you there. Um, so again, thanks, Teresa, for, for throwing it up and, and for your work in the background and making sure we get this all works for us. Um, it, it, she leaves it a lot easier for us in, in, on the front to get, get these things running successfully. So Stephen, I think that's all the questions we, we have there um, that's that's come in. Um, so it's been obviously a lot of interest with a good few questions there. And um, the presentation was excellent to see where that's going. Can you just, we're just near out of time, but going forward in terms of, you'll presumably be appearing on the webinars going forward and you'll be you'll have more information to put, put out there for, for people to look at. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, look at <clears throat> you'll you'll find if you if you follow uh, us on Twitter or check the website, look at we, we, and we'll send out information about future webinars. But definitely, it's an area we hope to explore 
definitely as, as you've seen there's a number of Irish companies involved and we look to engage with them uh, they all are expertise in their own rights in their own different fields and it'd be great to get some of them on and uh, detail their products and, and whatnot okay and just to close out then the twitter handle what's the that and the website address <clears throat> so it's uh, so erbia.org of course is our website and then at ireland underscore redirect uh, would be the twitter handle and you can email me uh, my email address is on the website as well so yeah, and we'll, have, we'll have that on the, on the information going out on the webinar afterwards as well. So again, thanks very much, Stephen. Uh, trees in the background and everyone else for, for your participation during the, the course of this webinar. It's been very interesting. Um, as I stated earlier, we will have our next webinar in two weeks' time. Um, and so and we will have, again, proceeding uh, fortnightly weekend or weeks on Wednesdays. So if there is any topics you would like to see covered, um, you, you feel free to contact us. And I uh, hope you enjoyed this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.